discussion for experiment seven, which is resolution of one phenyl ethyl amine. Resolution that takes more work than regular recrystallization or extraction. And the reason for that is we are trying to separate pair of enantiomers. What is unique about pair of enantiomers is that they, they have exact same boiling point, melting point, solubility. So the techniques we have learned so far, it does not work to separate these um, pair of molecules, which, which are compounds that they are mirror image of each other, Molecular formula is the same, connectivity is the same. They only have like a special arrangement in the space that one would rotate the plane polarized light to the right side, and the other one would rotate it to the left side. That's the only difference in terms of the physical property. Other physical property like boiling point, melting point, and the solubility, as I said, they are the same. So we cannot use distillation. We cannot use recrystallization. They have same acid-base property. We cannot use extraction. They have same polarity. So we cannot use chromatography. So we are using resolution. How does resolution work? And what is the purpose? I already said the purpose is trying to separate mixture of enantiomers. When you have a mixture of enantiomers, if it's 50-50% mixture is known as um, racemic mixture or racemate and racemic mixture of uh, one phenylethylamine is going to be separated today. What is going to happen or what are the steps? First, we are going to, because enantiomers, they have similar physical property and we cannot separate them. We are going to change them to something new by making react with a pure um, tartaric acid, pure enantiomer of tartaric acid, which is a 2R3R plus tartaric acid. If it reacts with one of the mirror images and the other mirror images, is going to give us two products. So we have tartaric acid reacting with R and S of this uh, amine, and it's going to give us uh, two products. The two products with respect to each other, they are not mirror image anymore. And since they are not mirror images anymore. So we get these two, and they are not mirror images of each other. They are known as diastermers. Diastermers, they have different physical property. They have different boiling point, solubility, different melting point. And these diastermers, they actually have different solubility in methanol. When we make this solution, we, we do this reaction in, in the methanol, but we don't use a lot of methanol. The solution is saturated. And uh, one of these compounds, the S product is not soluble in, in the, or S complex or S diastermer is not soluble in methanol and it gives us prismatic shape of crystals or it gives needle-like crystals and it's soluble in methanol or more soluble in, in methanol. If you get mixture of the two, you get prismatic and needle-like, then you must heat up slowly to re-dissolve the needle-like, cool it down, to get more of the, the prismatic. Bottom line, you have changed pair of enantiomers, which you have here, pair of enantiomers, to pair of diastermers. So these are diastermers, these are enantiomers.
the isomers, they have different boiling point or solubility, and it allows us to separate. And separation is going to be easier when you have the isomers. After, because they have different solubility, one is solid, the other one is solution, you can separate by filtration and you can use vacuum filtration or gravity filtration to separate. And when you have these crystals and you don't need the tartaric acid anymore, you wanna remove the tartaric acid, so you mix it with sodium hydroxide to remove the tartaric acid and you recover this S enantiomer of phenylethylamine. So I have, I included some of the steps here, uh, which it says you want to, uh, the prismatic crystals, that's those are the desired crystals. You wanna isolate them by vacuum filtration and you wanna add sodium hydroxide to remove the, the tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is soluble in sodium hydroxide, but the phenylethylamine is not soluble in sodium hydroxide. So it shows like an oily uh, layer of, of that compound. And uh, in order to separate and to remove from everything else that you might have in there, um, you are going to do uh, distillation. So you would do um, distillation um, and uh, remove this compound. Is this technique because sodium hydroxide is solution made with water and you, this is oily product. In practice, you are doing steam distillation. And when you do steam distillation, you would get like a cloudy mixture of water and this oil. But the other complex is going to stay in the solution. And after you have the distillate, you transfer that to separate your funnel you add some sodium chloride to salt out that amine. That means that you make the amine less soluble in salt water. And uh, then you separate the, the layers. The organic layer or the oily layer is your product. It needs to be dry. So you're using potassium carbonate as the drying agent. In this case, potassium carbonate and uh, is going to be removing the moisture. Then you just get the, the organic layer without any of the solid to measure the mass and also measure the optical activity. To measure the optical activity, there is a machine that we are using, it's called uh, polarimeter. Uh, polarimeter has plain polarized light or generates plain polarized light. And that light is going to be shined through our sample. So if you bring the plain polarized light, it is going to go through the sample. This sample is going to rotate that light to a different direction. And then you look through here. And in order to observe this light, you can you have you can find out by how many degrees has been rotated and the degrees that has been rotated actually that degree is known as the observed rotation and we call it like alpha that's observed rotation the machine would allow us to get, to read that degree degree of the rotation or observed uh, rotation if you have a racemic mixture or racemic mixture, that means 50-50% mixture, the net rotation is going to be zero. That means a racemic mixture, a racemic mixture is optically inactive. 50% of the compound is going to rotate to the right side. The other 50% would rotate to the left side. Net result would be zero. But if you have excess of one of the enantiomers, then it would show some, it would show um, rotation. The maximum rotation is going to be obtained if you have 
pure and antimer. If one of the, if you have like 100% of one of the pure and antimers, you would get the maximum rotation, which is equal to literature value for that anantimer. But if you get mixture of the two, basically you have anantimer excess, you have mixture of the two, and the rotation, the observed rotation, it's going to help you to determine how much of excess anantimer you have or what is the percent purity of the sample. How effective was your separation? When you have the observed rotation, which is this, that's observed rotation, okay? This is observed rotation. You can calculate a specific rotation because the observed rotation depends on concentration and depends on the length of the, the cell that you are using, if it's one decimeter or two decimeter, then you can calculate the specific rotation. But this specific rotation is the calculated one from the mixture that you have, or possibly the mixture that you have. There's also a specific rotation that is known as LIT, that stands for literature value. If you have the observed rotation and you have the literature value, you divide the observed by the literature value times 100, that gives optical purity. So if it says 80% pure, okay, that means 80% excess of the S enantiomer, and the other like 20% is a mixture of S and R enantiomer. And there's a sample problem in the experiment that can help you to find the percentage of each enantiomer. And like always, I want you to read the experiment and watch the pre-lab discussions. And in order to like clarify some of the points in the in the in the experiment, I have this pre-lab discussions. But together with both of them is going to help you to do well on the pre-lab quiz and understand the experiment. And of course, you can always ask questions. Anything that is missing, anything that is not clear to you, you ask questions. And if I'm the professor teaching the course, I would be very happy to answer your questions via email or discussions. Anybody who's teaching the course would be happy to help you and answer your, your questions, including me. Thank you. Thank you.